Okay, we are running. Live streaming the Red Bull. Welcome, a warm welcome to uh, this event, the book launch of an extraordinary book, a book that was missing for a long time in economic education. And um, my name is Mark Nijman. I'm the director of uh, Our Link Economy, and I will be your host uh, for this afternoon. And um, I remember a few years ago, some in yours, also Martin and Francis, wrote this book, Thinking Like an Economist. And the conclusion of this book was that in economy, there's a lot of neoclassical uh, education. A lot of new classical materials. And um, it was a bit dominant, to put it mildly. So there was time for a paradigm shift. And at a certain point in time, people start to agree yes, this time is already here. But how? How are we going to do? How, come, how are we going to shift the paradigm? And what materials are there to use in our education? That's a good question. So there was um, um, a lack of materials, right? and a lack of help of you how to make economy studies work in this paradigm shift. And um, I think in this paradigm shift we now have a new, reached a new milestone of the publication of this book. So let's see today how the project will be. We start with a short video of the economy studies, and then we have a presentation of Eric Stamm and a presentation of Martin Wolf, Chief Economist of the Financial Times. We have a presentation then by Sam Joris about the book, so that we know what it's about. Then we have an official launch moment for the book, and we have a short interview um, with Eric Stamm, and unfortunately, but Kit Halberdor of the Erasmus University is not available today because she has a cold or whatever, but in times of COVID, that's not possible to come here. Um, maybe she's watching from home. Uh, I wish you well. And then we have a presentation of Alan Turman. Um, he's doing an interview uh, done by William Heinz. And we end the session today with a QA. So it will be a long day, and for all of those of you who think uh, at a certain point in time you need to go to a toilet or whatever, uh, please use the side uh, routers because otherwise you go through the live stream. That will not be very elegant for the people at home. Um, yeah, anything else I need to say? Well, let's start with a short video. And um, because the writing of this book was a team effort. And to give you an impression, it's not only a team of some of yours held together, although they work really hard. Um, there are a lot of more people involved, rethinkers and the like. Um, so let's have a few at this short introduction moment. I'm Sam and this is Joris. We are from Rethinking Economics and Our New Economy. And we want to tell you about Economy Studies, our new guide for rethinking economics education. Our society is struggling with a lot of problems. Climate change, a growing social divide, financial instability. And when you look closely, the economy is often at the core of these questions. So we need good economic thinking to solve them. And in fact, there's a lot of valuable ideas out there that are not taught in standard courses, standard textbooks. We didn't write this book alone. We got a lot of help from academic economists and students around the world, but also from professional economists and from policymakers. Hi, I'm Alexandra. And I'm Jay Christopher. And we are Resinkers based in Rome. At the early stages of economy studies, we help provide some feedback, particularly trying to think through how economics education can be a little bit better. <laughs> and we really think that economics education needs to change. And mostly because every day there are so many things happening in our world. And our education is not perfect to provide us with the right tools to understand it and deal with it. Hi, I'm 
I'm Shiwa Demo. If you think I'm based in Nigeria, economics education needs to change because the current education isn't working. There's high inflation, high unemployment, and poverty rates, and the relevance of the education is being questioned. I want an economics education that is practicable, decolonized, so that it reflects the Nigerian economy. Hi, I'm Jane Barker. I'm a rethinker based in London, in England. I'm part of the economy studies team. I helped out with a number of chapters, but particularly the ones on pluralism and critical thinking. I think economics education really needs to change because at the moment it's completely unfit for purpose. And the economics students of today are going to be setting policy and, and running organisations in the future. And I want to see an economics education where different perspectives of people from different backgrounds are all valued that students are encouraged to think for themselves and that links into the real world and the challenges that it faces. But the problem is, where do you begin? Because the amount of teaching material out there, it can be overwhelming, sometimes really complex. And this is where the project Economy Studies comes in. Economy Studies is not a textbook. It's a guide for redesigning economics courses and programs. In the first part, the foundations, we outline the basic principles underpinning a good economics education. The second part are the building blocks. We provide 10 bundles of skills and knowledge. We suggest what to teach, how to teach, and which teaching materials to use. Then in the third part of the book, we provide practical tools for curriculum change. Hi, my name is Tisha Evita, and I am a rethinker from the Philippines. Economics education needs to change because the discipline has not been addressing the contradictories in its own curriculum and has been hesitant in borrowing scholarship from other social sciences, hindering us to make a holistic analysis of our economy. For example, there are development paths that enable us to preserve our dignities and in the environment, which is not yet reflected in the curriculum. I want an economics education that is representative of different local economic realities. An economics education that is responsive to issues like global climate change and inequality. And lastly, I want an economics education that is made understandable for the public so that everyone can take part in writing their own economic futures. I'm Rita, and I'm a rethinker from Lisbon, Portugal. I was part of the economy studies team that helped reviewing and giving feedback on a few of the chapters. The way I see it, economics education needs to change because economic systems are not set in stone. They can and should be altered and improved upon in order to better serve humanity. So I want an economics education that teaches students the transformative power of economics. And instead of seeing it as a set of laws, sees it as a set of tools that we can use to make the world a better place. My name is Nikhil Ghosh. I'm a rethinker based in the UK. Economics education needs to change because it's currently too rooted in a way of thinking that simply doesn't give students the tools they need to understand um, the economic realities around them. I want an economics education that is critical and diverse and really trains students to think beyond um, the conventional tools of equilibrium thinking and rationality uh, and really engage with the real-world behavior of economic agents and structures. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen. I'm a rethinker based in Paris. I was a part of the econo economy studies team and reviewed quite a few chapters and also did the um, expert training. Um, I think economics education needs to change because of the type of economics elites and the extreme consequences of that. Uh, creating extreme inequality and ecological degradation, so many things. And I just want economics education to make us challenge these things um, and lead a better economics. Hi, I'm James A. Van der Bethinker, based in Germany. Economics education needs to change because orthodox economic thought is not sufficient to solve the inherent global challenges and crises that we face today. I want an economics education that embraces interdisciplinary approaches that will enable us to create more a more sustainable and equitable So here, if you want to see the rest of it, that's very easy. 
you can go to the website of Economy uh, Studies and the, all uh, the rest of the video is over there. Um, our next speaker for uh, today, uh, we are so thankful that we can be here at uh, Utrecht University. And our next speaker is from Utrecht University, Erik Stam. He's the Dean and a Professor of Strategy, Organization and Entrepreneurship at the Utrecht University School of Economics. Um, Eric, please come to the stage. Um, I'm certain you can tell us a little bit about the new bachelor and the development uh, of that. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I would like yours. <laughs> to, to welcome you to uh, the Utrecht University School of Economics uh, here. Uh, we used to prepare wars uh, with our friendly neighbors, but today we prepare the war for talent. But I think that's not the right metaphor. So we are really preparing students to make the world a better place every day and every day. But uh, it's an honor and pleasure for me to serve as host for this uh, book launch of the Economy Studies. Uh, it comes as no surprise, uh, sorry Joris and, uh, and Sam, that this book is launched here at the Utrecht School of Economics. We don't position economics as the queen of the social sciences or as the dismal science or as the science that is only about the allocation of scarce resources. No. Uh, we see economics as the science of the good life. That might sound a bit old-fashioned, but I think that's also the way forward. And with all the uncertainties and dynamics that it involves, well, I don't have to tell you, we're still in the midst of the COVID, which is bringing a lot of uncertainties and dynamics, but also, I think, lessons for uh, having a better life in the future. Uh, it is our mission as our school to contribute to an eco economy where people flourish, just like what I said and we enrich rigorous and relevant economics with other disciplines to better see the problems around us, but also to recognize opportunities, because we are also here to build, to provide building blocks for a better world, so to say. Uh, and opportunities, not in some ivory tower, but in the real world. And I think that is really something that uh, brings us together, the economy studies, rethinking economics, the Utrecht School of Economics, our real world perspective is, is a part and parcel of what we uh, think, do, uh, rethink even, uh, uh, and everyday uh, uh, education and research. Uh, so that's also the reason why we, uh, I think, uh, and we as a school embraced the economy, uh, economics for a changing world by CORE, which is sort of a predecessor, you might say, in innovation in uh, economics education. And now we are really uh, glad to see a follow-up uh, in education, uh, economics education with this innovation. And I think that is really a global effort to uh, renew and improve economics like I think every discipline should do. So in that sense, uh, uh, I think this is a global uh, effort to be uh, applauded. Uh, but perhaps a bit more for economics than for some other disciplines. But well, uh, let's not go ahead of things. Uh, so it should be a bit like coming home for economy studies here at uh, Utrecht University School of Economics, I assume. But well, we are not here to congratulate ourselves, so not only at least. So uh, I think this is also, and first and foremost, a call to arms. Uh, why a call to arms? Well, because, because we live in a world full of challenges, challenges of unequal opportunities, insecurity, challenges to, to sustain the world in a way that also future generations can still flourish like we do, perhaps even better. Uh, we had the financial crisis of 2008, we had the COVID crisis, we had the harsh consequences of uh, changing uh, climate. I think there's lots of uncertainty. Uh, but also the certainty that new crises will come. Uh, whether that is bad or good news depends on us. Uh, and these challenges will continue to emerge. And that even puts more pressure on rethinking our education, our discipline, whether we are fit for purpose either to prevent those crises or to deal with those crises in a proper way that improves the real world and also the flourishing of people. And I think we can be front runners in tackling these challenges as economics. Uh, so that's good news for economics, because economics also brings, can bring together a lot of different disciplines to think about these crises in society and also to inform decision makers to make the right decision in conditions of uncertainty. And what is right, I think, is something that has, been, has not received enough attention in the past decades, but I think that has really put after the financial crisis, after the COVID crisis, I think there's much more di discussion on what is wealth, welfare, flourishing of people. Uh, and GDP was, an, was a good invention, but it's only an invention to tackle one of these dimensions of what is right, so to say. 
so in economics that is both rigorous and relevant, I think that remains, uh, relevant for the world's challenges of today, tomorrow, and the coming decades. Economy studies provides a very practical guide to do so, so they not only rethink, but also do, so to say, because teaching is something you also have to do. We, well, I don't have my, to tell my colleagues, but uh, most of the students and also the, the other audience that has been away from university for a while, uh, perhaps doing research and doing education also, we found out during the COVID crisis, something you need to do and need to change almost sometimes overnight even. And we're glad that we have building blocks and a practical guide to do so in an effective way. But I think redesigning economics also brings a challenge because on the one hand you need to have a core that everybody understands and can build upon, on the other hand have pluralism. And I think these things, it's really a balancing act to get the right uh, uh, chart, so to say. And I think the economy studies uh, have come close to such a balance. Of course, it remains to be seen in practice how far we get, but uh, the first step has been, big leap has been, uh, has been made. So, indeed, I would like to congratulate the economy uh, studies team and movement, because I think it's not, uh, well, we have two key players here, but it's also a, a movement that we want to set in motion. Uh, we, as Utrecht University School of Economics, are also reinventing our education every time, even though we are the youngest school of economics, so we have a bit less legacy than the others, perhaps. Uh, but let's make economics education great again, to, uh, uh, and, and again, and again, and again, because I think this is something that is a continuous effort. It's a collective effort that needs to be redone, and it ne never ends. It's a collective learning exercise, so to say. But for a good purpose, uh, to contribute to an economy where people flourish here and now, but also in other places and other generations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erik Stam. Um, I'm very uh, honored to announce uh, our next speaker. Um, although he's not here in the building, which is uh, uh, not uh, strange because he is not from this continent, um, we have our next speaker, Martin Wolf, Chief Economist, Commentator of the Financial Times. And um, as a commentator, Martin Wolf directly indicates every day what is happening in the economy. And therefore, it means a lot to us that he was willing to write the foreword of this book. And I can imagine that you are eager to learn what Martin Wolf wrote as a foreword. So just sit back and listen. He's doing it live here now on stage. What is economics? What is economics? It is the study of it the economy. What then is the economy? It is how we humans earn our living, how we organize ourselves to wrest the means of individual and collective survival from the world in which we live. As is true of all other living beings, humans must obtain the resources needed to survive from their environment. Most animals, even other primates, have relatively simple repertoires for finding and taking these resources. This is true even of the social insects, despite the complex division of labor within their nests and hives. Human activities are different in scale and kind. This is because human beings are intensely social and individually highly intelligent and adaptable. The complex human economy of today is the result. Since the human economy is entirely embedded in the natural and social worlds, economics needs to understand the natural and social contexts. The classical economists did attempt to do this to ex the extent that this was possible in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Thinkers like Adam Smith, Thomas Malthus, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx were interested in human motivation, resources, institutions, social classes, and political power. Yet such a wide canvas created problems for a discipline that wished to achieve a high academic status. It was felt to be inadequately scientific. In response, 
economics adopted the intellectual strategy that had worked so well for the physical sciences, reductionism. Thus it assumed away many complexities. For economics, humans were selfish, rational and far-sighted, resources abundant, information perfect, externalities insignificant, monopoly irrelevant, interpersonal comparisons of welfare impossible, money neutral, and financial markets efficient. Orthodox economics assumed away the complications created by unpriced assets, economies of scale, costs of innovation, uncertainty, stupidity, and the operations of human institutions and social values. It assumed humans away, putting robots in their place. The advantage of this intellectual strategy of heroic simplification is that it made it possible to analyze the economy as a simple equilibrium system. The disadvantage is that the assumptions are false. As the education of economists tended to become narrower and more mathematical, the nature and extent of these errors became more invisible. The inadequacy of economics has also affected the operation of the economy itself and arguably has always done so. This is, after all, the most important way in which a social science is different from a natural one. If we fail to understand the workings of the universe, it will still function, though some of the machines that we humans invent may not. If we fail to understand the economy, however, it may not function well at all because our ignorance will damage it. A good recent example is the global financial crisis, the biggest purely economic shock of the last few decades. As Ed Dare Turner, the influential British econo economist, has argued, in the early 2000s, economics came to underpin what he calls a political ideology, namely, and I quote, free market capitalism. The intellectual underpinning was the concept of market completion, the idea that the more market contracts could exist and the more freely, fairly, and transparently they could be struck, the closer we could get to the most efficient possible outcome most favorable to human welfare, end of quotation. This idea was, to put it mildly, a mistake. We must not exaggerate the failures of either the economy or of economics. In the broad, the economy has done its job almost miraculously well. By cooperating, human beings could indeed support themselves and their families vastly better than they could have done on their own. Even our hunter-gatherer ancestors were able to combine their efforts by cooperating in hunting, foraging, and bringing up children, ensure themselves by sharing food, diversify their skills by specializing, exploit differences in knowledge by exploring different terrain or foodstuffs on their own or in groups, broaden markets by trading, and communicate with one another by talking. Humans ended up massively outcompeting other animals that were individually far stronger and faster than they were. Indeed, humans became masters of the planet. The agricultural revolution was a huge jump in this direction, but the industrial revolution was a bigger and above all, far quicker one. The combination of scientific and technological advance with market competition and supportive political and social institutions has created a system of staggering complexity and scale. Today, the human economy supports close to 8 billion people. 
almost all of whom live longer and more prosperous lives than those of the great majority of the merely one billion people alive 200 years ago. The inventiveness is no less unbelievable. Estimates suggest that today, the world economy produces some 10 billion different goods and services. The human economy is in some an enormous success, yet it is also a failure, even a danger. Human beings and the livestock they rear for food now make up 96% of the mass of all the mammals on the planet. And extinction rates are thought to be 100 to 1,000 times higher than their background rate over the past tens of millions of years. Externalities have also become far more binding above all those created by the global environment. Or of inequality is pervasive within and across societies. The financial sector remains a source of instability. Corporations are run for the benefit of narrow groups of insiders. Monopoly is a pervasive force. New technologies are upending social and political relationships. The media are spreading destructive lies. And now even the foundations of democracy are corroding. Moreover, economics is part of the problem. This is partly because it leaves out so much that matters. It is also because what it assumes about economics is wrong. It does not merely assume homo economicus, but some would argue encourages people to become selfish, competitive and antisocial, though this is debated. Yet if everybody did behave as the rational self-seeker assumed by economics, civilized society, which relies so heavily on the unverified, even unverifiable trustworthiness of one's fellows, would surely collapse. Homo economicus could not have created Denmark or any other pros prosperous and highly cooperative societies. Economics is not only part of the problem because of how it simplifies, but also because of what it leaves out. This is true even though it has recently developed in significant and helpful directions to include imperfect competition, analyze asymmetric information, recognize endogenous growth, measure creative destruction, discuss multiple equilibria, distinguish happiness from incomes, and analyze actual human behavior. The discipline has become more empirical and broader while maintaining its core virtue of rigor. Yet even this is not enough. This book indicates how economics could become better still it does so by reclaiming economics as the queen of social sciences, the subject that seeks to analyze all aspects of the most important thing humans do together, namely cooperate to deliver flourishing lives to as many people as possible. If economics is to do this successfully, it must embrace a broader perspective. It must be more aware of what it is trying to do and of the wider context in which both the economy and economics itself operate. It must embrace breadth and complexity. The range of knowledge and abilities needed by economists is at the heart of the necessary transformation. In a celebrated passage, John Maynard Keynes argued that, and I quote, the master economist must possess a rare combination of gifts. He must reach a high standard in several different directions and must combine talents not often found together. He must be mathematician, historian, statesman, philosopher in some degree. He must understand symbols and speak in words. 
he must contemplate the particular in terms of the general and touch abstract and concrete in the same flight of thought. He must study the present in the light of the past for the purposes of the future. No part of man's nature or his institutions must lie currently outside his regard. He must be purposeful and disinterested in a simultaneous mood, as aloof and incorruptible as an artist, yet sometimes as near the earth as a politician. End of quotation. How is such a paragon to be produced? This book offers a good part of the answer. It broadens the foundations of economics by forcing economists to understand the history of the economy and the subject and so be aware of what economics tries to do and how it tries to do it. It proposes a practical route towards a better economic education. It provides a wide range of materials on how different schools approach the challenges and opportunities of studying the economy. It is, in sum, a distinguished effort to teach economists to become the sort of people Keynes thought they ought to be, broad intellectuals, not narrow technicians, and at the same time, practical guides, not just abstract thinkers. For many economists, the approach this book recommends will bring pain. And this is not just for selfish reasons. Those heroic simplica simplifications had virtues, with them will go the old clarity about what economists are supposed to do and how they are supposed to think. Yet the gains from a richer understanding of what the human economy exists to do and how it does and should work will more than compensate. Do I agree with everything in the book? No. But that surely is the point. A good book on the teaching and studying of economics should be challenging. Read, enjoy, learn. Martin Wolf, thank you very much. Um, well, we're almost half an hour into the program, and I have a feeling we're still missing two important economists here on stage. Um, may I ask for a warm round of applause for uh, Joris and Sam. <laughs> you will provide us with a presentation and um, maybe good to uh, uh, announce that if you have questions during the presentation, they will show in a minute. But keep your telephone ready, and we, uh, um, uh, we will uh, collect all the questions and come back to that in the Q&A later on in the program. So you can use your device to uh, send any question. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Is this microphone on? Ah, how about this? Better. And does this? Yes, great, it works. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's great to see so many, so many familiar and also a few unfamiliar faces in here. Uh, also, the people watching online at home, thanks for watching. Um, yeah, this is a special day for us, for, for Sam and me, and for the many other people who collaborated on this book. It's a bit of a milestone, so I just want to start with a thank you. Uh, Eric just mentioned that this might feel like a bit of a homecoming, and it does indeed. Uh, as he mentioned, Utrecht is one of the, is, is in fact the youngest economics faculty in the country, and, and this enables Utrecht to, to be more, how do you say this, uh, to, to, to be more courageous and more daring in their approach to searching for a better way to teach economics. So, yeah, 
thanks a lot for hosting us once again, also especially in COVID times when it's not so easy to host an outside event. We, we were welcome here, so thanks a lot. Um, also to our new economy, our colleagues there, Maarte. <laughs> Maarte, thanks. <laughs> Good moment for a smile. Um, and, and Julika, who is standing at the back, who has done so much work also for the, for the practical organizing of this day and for all the publicity around the book and, and a lot more that I won't mention here. Go to the website of Our New Economy and you find out more. Uh, and also to Amsterdam University Press. Inge is here, our editor. Yes. Inge, thanks a lot for, for guiding us through this publication process. Uh, and I want to say that there's, there's something a bit unusual about this book. It's completely open access and Creative Commons, which means open access is anyone can read it. Anyone who wants can download the PDF for free or chapters from it. And Creative Commons is a relative of open access, but it's something a bit different. You can reuse it. You can copy chapters or parts of chapters or the entire book uh, and do with it what seems right to you, what, whatever useful application you might find for them. Um, and Inge encouraged us early on in the process to, to publish it in this way, especially the open access part I didn't expect from a publisher, which also has to remain you know, economically viable. Uh, but she actually really encouraged us to do it like that, so thanks a lot for that too and to Bob, who, who formatted the book. Okay, that's my thanks for now. Um, a practical point, as Maarten mentioned, if you have some questions, uh, we have this application, Slido, so you can go to slido.com, and then they ask you for a number. You put in the number 159543, and you can put in questions that you have, or, which is even nicer, I think, vote on questions that other people have already put in there and say, okay, yeah, I want this question to be asked. And then in the last part of this presentation, uh, Marty will uh, take out his phone and just start from the top. And, uh, and Sam and I will answer these questions. So I'll try to keep it brief from here on. Perhaps good to say as well, yeah, the number is there for oh, yeah. the next slides. So no need to rush very quickly. Yeah. It will be there. Take your time. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, so top right, number. Um, okay, so briefly, this is the presentation. I will do the first half, Sam will do the second half. We just sort of cut it down the middle. I'll start with a bit of the origins of this project, Economy Studies, and then we get to uh, like a, no more than a sneak preview of what's in the book. You have a sneak preview in front of you as well, these little booklets. I'm sure you've opened them. Um, and then finally, what's, what, what happens from here on? because it, the work is not done. It's a milestone only. This is the first question. Why curriculum change? And the answer given here is the answer given by the author of the most popular uh, textbook of the 20th century, Paul Samuelson. And I think we, he got it right when he, he tried to describe how important economics teaching is. He said, well, I don't care who writes a nation's laws as long as I can write as economics textbooks, which determine the thinking that goes into these laws, I would add. Um, of course, economics is not the same as the economy. That, that system works partially independently, but the economic thinking that we have in our heads influences a lot whether we can solve the problems that are coming at us now and in the coming decades. So the origins of this project where lie in the Rethinking Economics movement, which is a worldwide movement of students who studied economics in, in very different places and yet had very similar grievances, you might say. The field felt too abstract and the theory, of which we got a lot, felt too much of one flavor, too similar to each other, a bit narrow. There was little real world knowledge in there and it seemed like the teaching we got and uh, teaching students in countries as far as India, Nigeria, Latin America, which is not a country, but you, you get my drift. Uh, the teaching was very similar around the world. So we came together in all these meetings and we started formulating what we thought was lacking. 
I won't name all of them, but what came out of this? One of the first things that came out of this, this is a movement of academics. So people didn't really take to the streets, although there were a few demonstrations and, and a walkout from a lecture now and then, but mostly with the, the student's way of activism was academic research. So we got a lot of curriculum reviews. Yeah, that's the last one, Sam and me and two others did in the Netherlands. And again, we all came to roughly the same conclusions too narrow, too theoretical, too abstract. Values completely banished out of sight from any discussion. But then, the next question is, what do you do? Because what we found is that these reviews were actually received rather well. I won't say welcomed with open arms, but a lot of the lecturers we spoke to said, yeah, maybe you have a point. Sure, but what then? How would you like us to teach economics? And we can't promise we'll do it like that, but we'll give it a try. And in fact, this question was at the time really hard to answer. So Sam and I came up with the idea of making maybe an example curriculum. You know, one, one blueprint saying, oh, what if the imagine a bachelor program like this. And we quickly realized that's not going to do it because rethinking economics as a movement is way too broad to publish only one program proposal and say, this is exactly what we want. In fact, we don't want ev everywhere to have the same program in the sense that, it, that that is the case now. We would like there to be very different programs in economics at different places. We think that pluralism of economists is just as important as pluralism within a single program. Uh, so we started a process of writing in terms of building blocks. We have a couple there. I have to admit they're empty, but the content is in the book. Um, and we wrote a modular approach using 10 building blocks and then an underlying foundation. Some will get to that in a minute. And here I just want to thank briefly all the students who helped to, to write this book and the more than 100 academics who gave input from around the world, often several times and often in great detail in their free time. So I briefly want to take you through the three parts of the book. I'll do the first part, Sam will take over that. The foundations is basically the, you could say the philosophy of science or maybe rather the philosophy of teaching, the philosophy of academic teaching of a subject. And uh, we'll take one or two examples from each of the parts. And from the foundations I'll just focus on the first one, the philosophy of economy studies. This is the first sort of substantial part, chapter of the book and it's about a big distinction in the field of economics where a, quite a prevalent approach is to say that economics is at heart a technique. It's a way of looking at the world. It's, you might say it's a pair of research glasses that you put on and you can look at anything from the coal market to the dating market as long as you look, as you think like an economist, this is also the chapter 1.1 of the most popular textbook still today, Mankiw, thinking like an economist, and then how are we supposed to learn to think? And we disagree with this approach. We think that economics should be at heart the study of the economy. Then what exactly is the economy? This is debatable. The boundaries are blurry. You might say something like the production, distribution, and consumption of whatever people need to lead a flourishing life, and then still the boundaries will be hard to define. But it's clear that there is this system out there in the world, the economic system, the economy, and we think any way to productively study this should be part of economics. The second part of the book is the building blocks, and here I want to give it over to Sam. Thanks. Oh. Yes. Thanks. Um, yes, the building blocks are really concrete bundles of skills and knowledge that are sort of give, give guides that could be a course about one building block. It can also be a building block such as, for example, economic theories, which there are many, many theories about this one building block, but it's sort of an overview of what is really important to teach the economists of the future. What are the skills, the knowledge, what are the things they need to learn during the programs so that once they go into the real world, they are prepared for their future careers and their jobs. So I will take you through only two of them. Um, but again, on the website, you can find everything, the free PDF. Um, I think perhaps also good to mention, we uh, unfortunately, we don't have the physical books all 
yet, yet, uh, yet uh, uh, because uh, there is a paper shortage. Uh, so we have a few of them, but fortunately the digital version is already available. Um, so the first one, um, know your own economy, which is all about getting to know the real world. So economics uh, courses are often about abstract theories, mathematical models, which is quite important and useful. But it's also really important to get to know the world around you, to get just a bit of a basis in how the economy looks. So I remember, for example, for myself, when I graduated from my economics bachelor, I realized, wait, what, did I learn something about the Dutch institutions, like the Social Economic Council, like uh, the Central Planning Bureau, or like how the Central Bank or the different ministries work? Not so much. That was not really the core or part of the program. Instead, we thought a lot about, we talked a lot about these mathematical models. And we think it's really important to actually for the future economists to give them this basis and also to get, give them this sort of the tools to find out this information. So you will not learn everything in your courses, but then you learn, for example, if you approach a sector, whether it's the energy sector or whether it's uh, retail, then you know a bit how to find the crucial information that you need if you work on a concrete problem that you need to solve as professional economist. So getting to learn how to approach this world around you and how to know your own economy. We think this is really important. Um, the second example is about ways of organizing the economy. And in a fancy term, it's also called economic organizations and mechanisms, but it's basically if you look out and we are here, for example, at a university, what kind of organization is that? It's not a simple company with shareholders making as much profit as it can. That's a different kind of organization. And if you go to the baker on the corner of the street, that's also different again. And if you go to, for example, our new economy, which is a foundation, also different again. So all these different kinds of organizations, students need to learn that they exist and how they function and how they relate to each other. And then mechanisms is more about how we interact with each other. So economics is often about the supply and demand in the market, which is really crucial. But for example, within an organization, often your boss doesn't say, how much money do you want for this task? No, there is a hierarchy. Your boss says you need to do this. This is part of your job description. So it's a different mechanism of sort of organizing the economic process. But there are many, many other mechanisms as well. For example, today I gave Joris a piece of bread, and it was just as a sort of friendship, a reciprocity. I didn't ask him for money. I was also not his boss demanding that he would take this bread. Um, but the next time I, he has a piece of bread and I'm a bit hungry, I expect perhaps something in return. So there is an in economic interaction going on here. And this is just one small example, but we think this is really useful for students to learn about. So a really simple, example of an exercise that could be done in courses is ask students to carefully observe in just one day what economic organizations and what mechanisms do they interact with. Just that they get an eye for seeing, hey wait, I did something with a friend of mine and that's an economic mechanism. And that you begin to see this and then you also begin to see how complex and how the economy is organized in all these different ways. And that sort of enables you to see a lot more than just supply and demand. These are just two. There are 10 in the book. Um, so we all, for every one of them, uh, we provide sort of an explanation of what we mean by economic organizations and mechanisms in this case. But we also give some suggestions for which teaching materials to use. Because of course, it's really important that you have good materials, that you can give students some reading, a good exercise. And we try to provide this. For some of them, it's a bit hard. For example, with this one, Unfortunately, I think there is still, uh, there could be better teaching material. So that's also where we, uh, where we aim to go further. Um, and of course this is nice, but how can you apply this in, in practice? Uh, and that's the third part of the book. It's really about the question, so okay, you have all these nice principles and building blocks for teaching, but I'm a, for example, a dean at a university or I teach labor economics, what can I do? And also as a student, I'm in this program, how can I actually do something with this? That's where the tools come in. Uh, there are a couple of tools. Uh, again, I will go into two of them, 
but a couple of others are review tools. So if you are a dean, you can just do an analysis of the program and see what is in the program, but also see what is missing and could be added to make it even more stronger. And also just to, for inspiration, we have example courses and example curricula showing, as you earlier said, that this is not one perfect curriculum that we are proposing. We don't think there is such a thing as the perfect curriculum in every country and in every different context and with a different purpose, you need different courses. So for example, here in Utrecht, and for example, if you would try to prepare economists to work in companies, you need a different program than if you work in India, trying to prepare, for example, government economists. You need different courses, that's obvious, but it also means we give suggestions on how these different programs could look. So the first one that I'm gonna talk about today is adapting existing courses. So it's basically, we take you through the typical economics courses, whether it's micro, macro, labor, environmental, finance, all the ones that you're probably familiar with if you are in economics education, uh, and we give suggestions. So if you want to include, for example, the economic organizations and mechanisms that we just discussed, different ways of organizing the economy, and you apply it to, for example, to labor, what are the different ways that wages, for example, can be negotiated and can be set? How can that be done? And how can you teach students some knowledge about this? Then how do you bring in values? So what are sort of the different normative principles, visions, the political debates surrounding this topic of labor? Then again, real world getting to know the institutions. So for example, in the Netherlands, the Socioeconomic Council is really important if you want to understand the Dutch labor market. And then history, labor history, getting to know a bit about the current situation and how this emerged from the past and how different sort of ways of organizing the labor market, how they have existed throughout history. And then last, different theories. So getting to know about, for example, the neoclassical approach, but also, for example, about Marxist ideas or post-Keynesian ideas or feminist ideas, all these different ideas, again, about one topic, labor. Labor is just one example. We apply this to all kinds of courses. Uh, and we think this is really useful both for students when they are in a course and they feel like it could be better, they can use this to go to their teachers and suggest, why don't you, for example, look at this textbook, which is really useful for teaching some additional materials or why wouldn't it be nice to spend one lecture talking about the different institutions to give really constructive suggestions on how courses could be better? And for teachers, of course, it can be a source of inspiration. Um, it's not a sort of a list that you need to check and you need to put everything that we suggest there. It's just meant as suggestions, inspirations for what could be in these kind of courses. Then, also really important because Economics education is a lot about preparing the economists for their future careers, but actually economics education is more often taught to people who will not become economists, but go on to have different kind of careers. But you could say they are citizen economists because everyone in their lives participates in the economy, whether it's in their personal lives, as I just described, I interact with yours in an economic way that doesn't make me an economist in that moment but also, of course, in our careers. We all have work. So the topic I just described, labor, is relevant to all of us. We all participate in this. And we all, of course, participate in the market. And with the COVID pandemic, we are all very familiar that the macro economy, sort of the economy at large, also really influences our personal lives. So we really want to also uh, give suggestions for how, what to teach about the economy to, for example, high school students, but also people who become uh, business entrepreneurs or managers and also for me people going into law or public administration. So we give suggestions for all these different kinds of courses. What can you do? Because obviously you cannot do as much as you would do for economists that take perhaps four years of their life studying the economy. What if you only have one course? What do you teach them? We give suggestions on how to do that for different groups. Again, there is no perfect way, but we just uh, give suggestions and inspiration for how to do this. Then, next up, nice, <laughs> a good video, uh, because as Jorah said, the book is sort of only one step in the process. It's not a book that is sort of meant just to be read and then put back in the shelf, and that was nice, it was a nice moment. The book has, is really something, a call to action. Some economics education needs to change because people, students, teachers, people really work on it. 
Um, so the book is not a goal in itself, it's just a tool in this process of reforming economics education. So we will definitely not be stopping with this. We will be continuing this work, and that's not only me and Joris, but that's of course the broader movement, Rethink Economics Around the World, Our New Economy. We will keep on working on workshops, developing new teaching materials, as I said, for example, on economic organizations and mechanisms that could be better material, um, but also organizing sessions on conferences, um, because we think it's odd that most academic, uh, yeah, academics come together often to talk about their research, but fairly, almost never, I would say, they come together, at least in international and really specialized settings, to talk about their education. So we really want to put education more in front, make everyone see how relevant it is, and that we can do a better job. Um, yeah, I think that was pretty much it. Am I forgetting something? No, that was it. Thanks. <laughs> Oh yeah, and um, perhaps again, the questions will be asked at a later s moment, so you can still, if, you, if this explanation, something was unclear, also for online on the live stream, you can post your questions, vote for them, and then we will uh, definitely take the ones with the most votes. So uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you uh, Sam for uh, the second part of the presentation and uh, Joris for the first part of the presentation. Uh, I have a feeling now at uh, 3 o'clock almost, it's time for an uh, official moment in the program. Um, the time to really launch the book. Uh, you have any idea uh, who we can give the book to? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Eric, can I uh, ask you to the stage? Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, Begritte is not here. We would have liked to hand it over to her as well, but yeah, that's life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, here we go. Yeah. But maybe there's a short thing you like to say uh, when, now you received the book and you know what's in there. Yeah, I, I, I liked the, the quote. It's sort of an age-old quote, which still counts from uh, John Maynard Keynes. I see my, uh, where's my colleague, Kees Koedenk. I just saw him entering. He also wrote a little book about Keynes. And uh, he sort of put the bar very high. And I think uh, we are trying to get at that height of the bar, so to say, to really have rounded economist scholars. And perhaps to paraphrase uh, a recent Nobel Prize winner, I think economists should be more like plumbers, at least microeconomists. And perhaps macroeconomists can be more like gardeners and perhaps a bit less like informing chess players. And I think this book is uh, one way to go. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy reading the book. Yeah. And, so before we dive into the question and answers, um, let's have a look at our next uh, two speakers. There, um, yeah, that's why I have these cards. Um, our next uh, part of the program is an interview, and the interview is uh, taken by uh, William Hines. And William Hines is a senior advisor to the Secretary General of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development and head of the New Approaches to Economic Challenges Unit. That's quite a title. Um, in which he provides a space to question traditional economic ideas and offer economic narratives, new tools, methods, and policy approaches. And he will interview uh, Alan Kernman. And Alan Kerman is an influential economist and director of studies at the uh, Ecole des Hautes Etudes et Sciences Sociales. And he is Professor Emeritus of the Economics at the University of Paul Cezanne. Have a look at the interview, and um, after that, we go into the QA. So if you have your last questions, add them to your uh, mobile phone. Okay, well, it's, um, it's great to be here to um, speak in support of uh, the launch of an exciting new book uh, called uh, 
Econo economy studies, a guide to rethinking economics education, and um, really very impressed by the enterprising group of students who have put together this book. And um, we hope that uh, it will help change economics education, both in the Netherlands and of course, more generally, but I'm delighted to be joined in our discussion of uh, what's going on in economics and maybe the OECD take on all this uh, through the new thinking movement on in the OECD called New Approaches to Economic Challenges. But it's, um, it's really a legendary figure uh, in the world of economics and who's been in his whole career, well, not in his whole career, but uh, maybe in the second half of his career was really pushing for a more interdisciplinary approach to uh, economics. But Alan Kerman, delighted to... Uh, to talk to you today about these important issues, about where we stand in economics and how this book fits into a broader debate about whether we want to modify or upgrade our understanding of economics or whether we need to transform the discipline. Uh, but uh, welcome, Alan. Thank you, William. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a, a very important subject. And we're always torn between trying to hang out thinking on the framework that people have built up over some 200 years now and always trying to sort of bend it back into that or actually take off on a completely different track which people have tried of course from time to time but usually you get forced back into the sort of more or less standard um, framework and people are trying to see how they can interpret what's going on within that framework and and there's the problem and the big hope is that the younger generation will be ready to actually start building a new framework, different from the one we have, and which will cause a lot of um, disturbance to a lot of people because they've got all invested in the old system. But, you know, that's the way it is. Every now and then these things do happen. And uh, we've had paradigm changes in other fields. And let, let me give you one quick example and uh, then you can take it up. But um, in biology, for a, a long time, there was a uh, in the introduction of molecular biology. Now that took over from people who were in what was called organismic biology, where guys would sit in their laboratories and they would, or in their offices, and they would have sort of sp uh, stuffed members of different species behind them and so forth. And that was what a biologist was all about. And then when molecular biology took over, everybody was looking down a microscope. So they were looking, they forgot about animals and, and the uh, ecological network, essentially. And, and all the sort of important work in biology was going on in molecular biology. So that was the thing. Hmm. And uh, so everybody said, well, that's the sort of end of biology as we used to know it. But recently what's happened is that now systems biology has become the big thing. So systems biology has started to take over in the major universities where people say, you know, it's no good spending all our time looking at the DNA of these animals and so forth. We should actually also be worried about the whole uh, system and how it works and how it's interlocked and how the interactions happen. And I think that's the sort of revolution that should happen at some point in economics, and it's still not happening yet. Right. But I think this debate about whether... You know, there's going to be a revolution in economics or whether the lessons of the financial crisis and the lessons of COVID and all of these perturbations of the system where we think, uh, yeah, we, there was things we didn't understand about the economic system, but now we, we're, we're dealing with these issues. And there is a sense, and uh, The Economist just recently, you know, the idea that economics is looking at new sources of data, real-time information, that it's uh, it's improved things by looking at high degrees of uh, realism or moderate degrees of realism in behavior and in institutions, and that um, essentially we've added things on. So we're a lot more concerned about environment, about social questions, and that uh, taken together, these reforms basically leave economics in a much better place. Now, maybe another way of thinking about this is that we've... Um, improve the old framework, as you say. We haven't developed a new framework, which, um, and there have been efforts to encourage more interdisciplinarity, but it's 
we're still very much having these discussions on the terms of economists. So trying to uh, improve models, looking at heterogeneity, for example, is another good example that we've, we look at, instead of just representative agent models, we look at two agents or heterogeneous agents, but it might not be as going as far as, uh, you know, physicists might think we need to or other disciplines. And it's the same with behavior, uh, where we, again, we've adapted, we've amended it. We do think about uh, cognitive constraints and how we need to change behavior so that the behavior fits the model. But is this going far enough? And I guess the question to you is that uh, your analogy was that if uh, this idea of fixing up economics was uh, camp two on a mountain or camp halfway up the mountain, that this transformation might not actually be on the same mountain. And so this uh, effort to improve and incrementally uh, change the discipline of economics, it might not lead us to this transformative approach, which is more interdisciplinary. But what's your take on all that? Yeah, but I think that's right. But the, the yeah, the problem is that you start out uh, up this mountain, you see, and it gets more and more difficult, and it did get more and more technically difficult. And so then people get judged by their skill on climbing the rock faces on that particular mountain. Mm. But just suppose it's the wrong mountain. You know, I once with my kids climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, or climbed, walked up Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> and when you get to the top, you can see in the distance, if it's a clear day, Mount Kenya. But Mount Kenya is a bit lower than Mount Kilimanjaro. And you think of all those guys who started out about up Mount Kenya, thinking that was the highest mountain in Africa, and uh, find themselves talking about, well, that was the wrong mountain. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a sort of analogy. But um, I think to be uh, slightly less facetious, there's something, there is an important lesson here because you keep seeing people, they say, well, now we take behavior into account. Mm -hmm. And behavior, for example, means uh, what's called nudges. These are uh, tricks to teach people to think in a way which will make them better off. But that means that somebody knows what will make them better off, first of all. And it's not obvious that uh, some outside authority has that idea, exactly what makes you better off. And then these things are terribly badly interpreted. The Economist recently said, you know, uh, that France tried a nudge to get people to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So what was the nudge? Well, the nudge was to say, you can't go and take a coffee in your local cafe, even on the terrace, without a vaccine vaccination pass. So you have to show that, you know, uh, when you before you can even get your coffee. Now that, after Macron announced that, over a million people the next day signed up for vaccination. So that wasn't a nudge, that was a kick in the rear end. You know, <laughs> the idea that that was some subtle form of influencing of people, it was just a kind of, they found out where people's sort of weakness was mm -hmm. and then just tackled it and it worked very well. But that's not very subtle. I mean, that's not really transforming economics in any way. But right. people said this is a triumph for behavioral economics. But I think, you know, that's thinking in a very shallow way. So end of the, of the video. Um, maybe in terms of multidisciplinarity, there are some ranges where you need to act uh, between. Uh, um, so that was the end of the interview. Uh, I have my wrong card here. But William Hines, interviewed by Alan Kurdman. Um, I think it's time for the Q&A. Yes, yes, yes. And what I need to do, I uh, will check the, the questions that are popping in, or maybe put them on the screen. That might be easier. Um, maybe in advance, uh, some of yours, uh, come over here. Uh. Technical lead takes over. Oh, what's going to happen? <laughs> You put it on the screen. Yeah. There's so many of me. <laughs> and oh, no, no internet. Well, there should the be uh, something wrong always in a presentation. Uh, otherwise, we're not doing a good job. Can also oh, the, that's, that's, that's OK. We will do it with uh, a telephone. Everyone can see the questions <laughs> on their telephone already. Oh. So, uh, um, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe a first question uh, I have. You uh, wrote a book, 400. 65 pages, 
and there were more and more words, but Amsterdam University Press couldn't fit it within, <laughs> within print. Um, you also developed a website. You held a lot of workshops. Um, quite busy for uh, almost three years. Last year, very busy. So my first question is, do you guys have any hobbies? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, you take it. You have the mic. Yeah, I have the mic. <laughs> yeah, and uh, thanks. <laughs> well, uh, I guess you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, very good question, and uh, they they definitely sometimes do uh, get pushed out a bit. Uh, so it's always a challenge to uh, to give them more time and energy uh, than than yeah, because yeah, I I, I break dance uh, a lot and make hip hop music, so so I'm uh, definitely planning to focus more on more on those things over the next months that uh, the book is now finally launched. Uh, so that will sort of give me some uh, more breathing space. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to also being more into music and, and, and dancing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we will we'll also continue to work on the book, of course, but yeah. Yeah, 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 hobbies, yeah. Uh, basically, for me, anything with water, swimming, surfing, sailing, uh, in the winter, it's, it's less fun. Um, <laughs> And I used to do kickboxing, but it, it dropped out. Maybe I need to pick up my hobbies again. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, um, how shall we do this? Shall we just take the questions ourselves? You have a microphone, just better. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we sit? Yeah. Let's uh, make it a cozy vibe here. Do you want to take the first question? Yeah. Okay. I'll ask it to you. Okay. So what are the largest structural changes you have identified that stand in the way of the change you propose by Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks Mr. or Mr. Anonymous. Um, yeah, this is a big question. The, the biggest structural obstacles to this kind of change. I'd say a very big one is uh, the way um, universities are organized and financed. So basically, if you, are, if you teach economics uh, in a university, then you are not, um, your career doesn't work really in any way uh, along your teaching. So you are judged in your career as a researcher almost exclusively. Um, and I think this is strange because, you know, teaching is, is for most academics at least half of their time. And I think, uh, and, and sometimes it can be a painful admission if you identify primarily as a researcher, but I think it's often more than half of the influence you have on the world because your teaching often reaches so many more people than your research papers. Um, so I think the, the, the way universities are organized, careers are judged, and universities are financed should, should really be changed a bit to reflect this to give people more space for teaching and, and more rewards for good teaching. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the biggest one I can come up with. Cool, I'll give you uh, the question. <laughs> okay. So this one also from Anonymous. There's often a lot of critique about neoclassical economics. In your research, what did you find that was good in neoclassical economics? Where does it fit into the pluralism that you propose? Yeah, very good question, and indeed, that's, uh, that's often not sort of on the front of our presentations because we say we need change, uh, but very well uh, recognized, we don't say neoclassical is all bad and needs to be pushed out completely. Uh, we think it should be part of economics courses, but just less than it is now. Uh, so what to keep in? Um, I think, I think um, we, we, we have an overview of all the different sort of, or all of a lot of different theories on different topics. Uh, so there we really specifically identify of what are really key insights. Uh, I'll just pick a couple to have as example, but if you're really interested to know sort of the full overview of what we think of neoclassical to keep, uh, the chapter Pragmatic Pluralism really gives the answer. Um, so I think, for example, if you look at uh, nature and you look at, for example, climate change, I think the concept of externalities is really useful. Uh, and if you also work as pro professional economists at, a, for example, the ministry, Using these kind of methods, for example, to think about a carbon tax or emission trading schemes is really useful. Uh, so I would not say, like, get away with that concept. Uh, another one really related is opportunity cost. Um, so, 
for the non-economists uh, here, brief, brief, very short explanation. We don't only pay with the money that we sort of have to pay as the price for products, but doing something means not doing something else. Uh, and that's sort of the opportunity cost. So if you do one thing, you cannot do something else. And really taking that into account is, I think, one of the concepts of neoclassical economics that is really, really valuable. And I would definitely keep in the programs. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. We will uh, turn it around. Uh, all right. Short question. If you could have one person in the world read it, who would that be? Who? OK. <laughs> um, yeah. Hmm. OK, maybe the, uh, the head of the International Economics Association or, or the American Economics Association, which is actually probably more influential than the international one, the worldwide one. Um, and okay, so I'm kind of going back to the, the previous thing I said, where people are judged so much more because of their research. Uh, specifically, people are judged so much more because of their journal publications in what's in economics called the Big Five, the the most prestigious five journals. And and I think if the editor, the editorial board of these journals would um, would embrace the idea of pluralism. The notion that that several distinct frameworks side by side work better to to generate insights than one very even if it's one very complete model, but you know you can you can only make make a model or a theory so complex and add so more so many more things before it becomes useless. So if I think if if the the president of the well let's say American Economic Association would read this book and, and adopt the principle of pluralism in their journals. Yeah, that would be great. By the way, that's David Carter, who just got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, also <laughs> a bonus point then. Yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, let's see. Anonymous, again. <clears throat> Many thanks for developing such an important comprehensive book. Has somebody already agreed to use the content of your guide to change the curriculum? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, we fortunately, in the Netherlands, we have quite good contacts with several universities. Uh, so, of course, here at Utrecht, but also uh, back of the room in Nijmegen. Uh, and I'm not sure there is someone here today. Yeah, I mean, I see uh, uh, also someone from the Food University. Um, and especially at the last university, they are building a new bachelor program, largely based also on these ideas. Uh, Arjen Wittlostein, the dean there, agreed that uh, yeah, he saw the need basically for a new program with a new approach. Uh, so we asked Arjo Klamer and the professor to really set up this program. And we have been a lot in contact, sharing sort of draft versions of the book with him while we were writing and refining it and sort of trying it out in practice. So uh, yeah, it was very concrete. There needs to be an actual program set up, uh, and they are currently in the process of uh, uh, the accreditation, difficult word to pronounce, uh, but basically getting agreed by uh, that it's an official program. Uh, so hopefully it will start in a few years, uh, yeah, largely based on these ideas. But as said, a lot of other universities are also already working on sort of adapting existing courses and changing uh, which courses or electives are available. Uh, so luckily it's not just uh, some abstract book that we dream up, that change will happen, but luckily it's already happening. Yeah. Nice, thanks. Yeah. All right, all right. Um, all right, all right. Where are we? Ah, here. Should the student and not the teacher have more power to design or at least influence his or her bachelor curriculum? Ooh. Um. Uh, by the way, if you want to put in any other questions, just you can still do that. So this gets updated live. Also for the people watching, it doesn't. Yeah, obviously this is a website, so you can do it from anywhere. Um, yeah, should the student and not the teacher have have, have the primary say over the program, right? Um, poof. I, I don't, I don't think so. Actually, I don't think it should be democratic in the sense that sort of you ask students when they come walking in, hey, what do you want to learn? Because as a student, you, you come there because you want to learn about something and, and, and because you actually, uh, you know, 
because you don't know and you want to know. But then again, it, I think it happens too often that people run a roughly similar program for 20, 30 years and, and, and become a bit disengaged from, first, from the changes maybe in the world, which require different thinking, and second, from what the, what the young people visiting their class are interested in. And I think that the biggest way that this happens is, is often that, yeah, as I said, academics generally self-identify as researchers and, and I think it happens too much that, that as a professor you're busy training the students, giving them the basics of how to become like you. Like the basics in learning the skills that you need to publish in big academic journals. And I don't think that's what most students come for. I mean, we, we did some statistical work, just very basic numbers, 97% out of all students that starts an economic bachelor does not later start an economics PhD. And then of the people who do a PhD also, many don't become academic researchers. But 97% don't even start any academic research in that sense. So I think what, what you should give students is uh, a much broader skill set than what you would what you would give a future academic researcher, a future version of yourself. It shouldn't be less critical thinking, it shouldn't be less rigorous, but it should definitely be a different skill set. And I think people tend to forget that once you've been a researcher yourself for, for maybe 20 years, it becomes hard to imagine yeah, that students come in with a very different set of questions about understanding the economy and also go out to very different environments than where you work, maybe. Yeah. Cool. Don't know if that's an answer to the question, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, here's one that, that recently came up from Swein. Which universities are leading the way in rethinking economics and which countries are most innovative in this regard? Cool. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, well, I basically gave the, gave the short summary for, uh, for universities in the Netherlands uh, with the previous question. Um, but I would say internationally there, there are even more innovative places. Um, there is currently also sort of, a, an, a, it's called promoting economic pluralism, where they are trying to make a good overview of all the different programs around the world. Um, that's a really useful website if, if you're really keen on getting to know this because I, I don't know all the statistics and all the universities from, from the top of my head. Um, I do, do know a couple of them, really famous ones. For example, the New School in New York has been for a long, long time sort of a bastion for sort of dissident economic thinkers. Um, but also, of course, in many, many universities also in the UK have been quite, uh, quite innovative and, and challenging. Um, but also Kusanis in, in Germany has been, has been doing some different things. So, so there are many universities. Um, those are the ones that, that spring at the moment to, to top of mind. But, but uh, as I said, I, I am also not an expert on all the programs around the world. Uh, so so I, I wouldn't know exactly where the, all the sort of beautiful yeah. things are going on. Perhaps I'm forgetting one. Uh, Probably, uh, but I don't <laughs> know. Yeah, no. Yeah. But promoting economic pluralism, look up that website if you're really interested to see more of an overview. That's a, that's a useful one. Cool, cool, cool. Another one that popped up by Marcel. Uh, why do we have only see? Why do we are only seeing white males speaking? A more critical question. Yeah. No, that's okay. That's a that's uh, yeah. Um, that's a very good question. Um, so, I mean, we can't help being white males, but that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a lame answer to this question. I think partially this reflects a problem in the discipline where the deans of most Dutch faculties, I'm not sure about all. Oh. Okay, the deans <laughs> of all. Yes, but yeah, exactly what she said, yeah. yeah. So the deans, currently the deans of all Dutch economics faculties are white men. Um, and and, and this, is not, this is not a specifically Dutch thing. So this is a worldwide issue of, of, of a big lack of diversity 
Uh, there's a point from Marcel. Marcel. Yeah, Marcel, yeah. Did you raise the question if this yeah, is you? I'm, I'm, I think you're right. I'm getting to that. Yeah. Yeah, Marcel, I think you're right. You're completely right. And I was getting to that in the second part. So the first part, it's an institutional problem that exists. And in the second part, yeah, we, we could have done this much, much better. Um, and and it's, it's a failure, I think, also on our part to more actively look for that diversity. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this needs to get into everybody's system and definitely also into ours. And it's, it's yeah, good question. I'm glad you asked it. Did you want to add anything to that? OK, yeah. Thanks for asking. Perhaps also uh, one last point. We, we have one chapter in the book uh, called Decolonizing and Diversifying Economics, uh, which is largely on the topic uh, you just raised about the institutional sort of setting in, in economics as, as a discipline, uh, but also really on the content of courses. So sort of where are things like it, it's a practice we need to sort of invite different speakers. Uh, but it's also about which content do we teach in programs. So for example, uh, as Jorah said, it's not only a problem in the Netherlands that these courses are this way, but currently these textbooks, often written by American authors, are used all around the world. So here in the Netherlands, I didn't learn about the Dutch economic context, uh, but especially for rethinkers we saw in the video earlier who live in the Philippines or in Nigeria, they also don't learn about their own context and the different or ways of organizing, the different mechanisms, sort of the way they organize their economy, the things that are relevant for them, are often not really reflected in their pro courses and programs. So, so in that chapter, we really put the emphasis that this really needs to change and really needs to be put there. Uh, and also that we sort of need to take serious the ideas that come not from white men like us, uh, but come from people from around the world, whether it's women, people of color, uh, so, for example, structuralist economics is this old approach coming from Latin America, which is really, really relevant insights for understanding global inequality. How can countries uh, be poor and, and, and there is no real sort of military occupation, but still there is a flow of money going to the rich countries. Sort of getting to understand this, these ideas are really relevant. So. It's just we, we, we definitely think this is important and try to uh, yeah, put more emphasis on this. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of steps need to be taken. Um, in your book, do you define the need for economic students to take courses outside their discipline, like environmental science or AI? Yeah, uh, good question. And this is, this is one which we debated a lot. Uh, yeah. And sometimes we, we still. Uh, <laughs> the book is finished, but our thinking is definitely not standing still. Um, we, on a certain level, we think that can be really useful, uh, but we were thinking, so in an economics program, do you always need to learn something about, I don't know what examples were, AI, internet, artificial intelligence, or for example, sociology or biology, should, for example, the first year just be learning about all kinds of different disciplines. Um, we think this can be a very useful approach. Uh, often this is called liberal arts and sciences, I think, uh, where this more interdisciplinary approach is used. Uh, but we wouldn't say that's the only way to do it. Um, so we really think it's also still valuable to sort of have the focus on this one topic. Um, but having the focus on this one topic means understanding in what it is embedded and getting sort of a basic idea of the interactions, whether it's with sociology or with political science or with biology. Um, so in the first building block, we have introducing the economy, and their large part is really focused on this sort of getting to understand how the economy is embedded and how it relates to different disciplines. Uh, so we think that's definitely part of it, uh, and we think it's really useful. Um, but uh, where we do really emphasize, emphasize interdisciplinarity is sort of more other social scientists studying the economy. So if you go in sociology, there is this field called economic sociology. It's basically sociologists studying the economy. And if you go into geography, you have the same thing, economic ge geography. In history, you have the same thing, 
In anthropology, you have the same thing, and in political science, you also have the same thing. So we think these sub-disciplines really need to be integrated because they are about the same topic that we as economists study. So we really see that as part of sort of what could be in the, all these courses. Uh, so we really emphasize that point and we really think that should be in every program. Um, yeah. All right. Is the approach going to be bottom-up education pointing towards politics or are you also considering top down, a top-down approach? Low, I'm not sure what low means. Ah, in other words, sorry, it's an it's a I, not an L, yes. Do you have political aspirations? Wow, Joris, do you want to run for uh, prime minister? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, well, so yeah, the short answer is no, but the, the, the longer answer is that I think in, um, in, in government agencies, there's also often very homogeneous thinking about economic questions. Uh, and in some cases, this is, uh, this is installed, instilled through uh, a structured program. Uh, when you come in as a, as a government economist in, in the Dutch national government, there's a training program you go through, which is, again, in, in a sense, thinking like an economist, um, mm. and, and which runs along largely the same lines as uh, neoclassical economics. And this is, and, and, and in different countries, this works in different ways. But uh, there's often this homogeneity, and this is something where where I think there there could really be a change as well. So, yeah, I, I would love these um, government economist training programs to be different, and and I would love there to be a bit more structured guidance on how to use something like. Uh, a pluralist or a more pragmatic, uh, real-world centered approach in policy making. Um, I know that William Hines, who spoke from the OECD, is working on a, on a program in that direction and, and we're talking to him and hoping to be able to contribute something to that program as well. So I, I guess that's as close as it comes to political aspirations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I, uh, I'm also not looking forward to becoming a politician. Yeah. No. <laughs> what are some questions that remain? Some food for thought. Ooh. Big open. That's a big one. Take your pick. Um, good question. Some questions that remain. Um, well, Perhaps that's, a, that's an interesting uh, debate we had with uh, the, one of the art authors of, of the book uh, Core, uh, Wendy Carling. Um, and that's whether the current sort of way of thinking and teaching is, is often described as one paradigm. Um, it's sort of, yeah, as you already explained, it's like thinking like an economist, there is a way to think. Um, and the question is then, should this be replaced by a different way of thinking, one way, different way of thinking, or should it be replaced by a diversity, a pluralism, different ways of thinking? Um, in our book, we, we take the position of the last one. Uh, so we propose to, to have different theories in courses uh, so that students le learn about different ideas and then for themselves make up their own mind. Um, Wendy Carlin doesn't agree with this approach, and in her book, she really says we propose a new paradigm, one new sort of comprehensive, coherent model which provides the answers. Uh, because she argues um, if you say, well, do all these other things as well, then it stays a sort of an extra, uh, and it doesn't replace the core. Um, and I think also when we, dis yeah, when we even have, we, when we speak to sympathetic uh, economists, they often rephrase our goal as indeed sort of creating ads, ads ons to the current core program, uh, which we really think that is not how we intend the book. We, we, we really intend it as a new basis, a new core. Um, but Wendy Carlin, uh, she really argues that, that this approach we are proposing and with Rethink Economics Around the World, uh, for that reason, will not be successful. Um, 
So that's quite a, quite a, a challenge to, to our approach. And I, I still think that economics or academic education in general should not be learning about to think in one way. I think it's really about learning to think independently, making up your own mind, getting to know what the debate is, and then taking a stance in it yourself. Um, so, so on that front, I, I haven't changed my position, but from a practical point of view, I do wonder whether it will indeed happen that in economics, these different approaches will become really important rather than just add-ons, sort of an extra, an elective, an alternative in the third year, if you're interested in that. Uh, we really propose that from the first year, from the beginning, and in every course, uh, you introduce students to debates. Um, Wendy Collins argues that's probably not going to happen, so you just need to have one new paradigm, uh, and that's what her book really, in a, in a well way, uh, provides. Um, but I, I, that's, that's one of the big questions that is in my mind, is, is sort of how will it happen in practice? Uh, and a bit related to the previous question, um, in sort of policy making and in politics, what do we need there? Do we need a pluralism, a diversity of thinking, or do we need a new consensus? So do we need to go from a consensus around neoliberalism or focusing on GDP, focusing on economic growth, however you want to sort of characterize the previous consensus we had? And do we need to go to a new consensus, uh, especially in a country like the Netherlands where consensus is quite big, often in politics? Uh, that does seem quite a logical next step. Um, but at the same time, I, the sort of, I guess that's more, the more academic me uh, that, that says, but it's really important to also have an open debate, have these different perspectives brought in. And I guess uh, at the same time, the Netherlands also shows this with our really big diversity of political parties that are all having their own points and insights. So um, I'm always a bit drawn between those two. I, I see the need for a new consensus, a new basis, something we can share so that you can also really like get to action and do it. Uh, but at the same time, I'm also that academic that really values having an open debate. Um, yeah, I don't know. That was one that was in my mind that I'm st often still thinking about. Nice. <laughs> yes. Cool. Are there uh, more questions coming in? Yeah. We are, uh, I think we, it, it often happens that the program is running too long. I think we actually uh, were quicker than expected. Uh, so that's also quite nice sometimes. Um, we have another question from Mike. Um, would pluralism of ideas and methodology lead to a Babylonian confusion? How can we ensure diversity in economics programs remains productive, a productive pursuit? Yeah. Productive scientific pursuit, yes. Yeah, yeah. good question. And, and something we really grappled with for a long time on this book because so, so in economy studies, uh, we identify 16 different um, major approaches to economic questions. And you cannot teach 16 different approaches on a single topic. It's just, yeah, it's a mess. So one thing we did in the book was to, to identify, to make a, a first attempt at identifying four sort of major fields within the discipline, let's say labor, money, nature, firms, business cycles. For each of these, which maybe two, three, four, five approaches really make substantial contributions and which ones can you safely leave out and you don't miss that much. And now if you ask someone from one particular approach, let's say you ask uh, an institutional economist, you know, do you have something smart to say on labor? They will always say yes, or on this topic, yes, of course, institutional economics is the greatest thing. And if you ask them on, from the neoclassical point of view, they will say the same. But if you zoom out a little bit, you notice that the different approaches really do have different uh, points of emphasis. emphasis. Um, so that's what we try to do on the level of economic topics within the discipline. And, and that still, of course, leaves open the question if you have sort of this worldwide uh, broad community of economists, will they be able to understand each other and, and will it be possible to, to communicate this to students even first year, second years? And here I think there's, there's quite a lot that economics can learn from the other, many of the other social sciences like sociology or political science where 
where really this notion of pluralism, of teaching different approaches side by side, is just standard from year one, and it's quite possible. It's not possible if you want to do the full mathematical modeling for each of the approaches, which uh, some people um, say that it's not economics if it's not mathematics. Then it becomes quite difficult, but to, to, to teach the intuitive understanding and, and the, core, the core insights of these different approaches side by side, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's quite possible, even for first year students, and, and to get across different ideas from different approaches, if you have a shared basis of understanding of this larger economic system is also, I think, quite possible. Yeah. And maybe, maybe to add on to that, because uh, arguing that it's really about this intuitive understanding of, of an insight or of a theory uh, is among economists quite a controversial thing to suggest. You don't need to teach the whole model and all the technicalities of it. You only need to teach the core ideas and how to apply these. Um, many academic economists don't agree with us on this. Uh, the reason we are fairly confident in saying this is because uh, research being done, interviews, surveys, among employers and professional economists often emphasize that the current education is very much focused on all these mathematical skills, but in practice they rarely need it. So the employers, the bosses sort of economists uh, working as in, whether it's in a company or whether it's in a government agency, they say, well, it's nice that he can do some math, but I don't need that. I need someone who just understands sort of the political context, need to know how to apply these abstract ideas, need to know how to explain it to me, and I didn't study economics, so you need different skills from economists. Uh, and that's really, I think, why we are quite confident in saying economics courses can change in a quite fundamental or radical way, moving away from this heavy focus on the technical mathematical skills, moving more to the substantial understanding of these economic ideas and how to apply them in practice. Because if you ask a professional economist or their boss, they say that this is what they need. So it's not just us as your students just graduated or, well, you already did your PhD, you're a bit further now. Oh. Um, yeah, but it's, it's sort of among this broad, and that's also not just in the Netherlands, uh, but it's really studies in different countries uh, indicating this, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, economics often as a discipline claims to be objective and positive, value-free as compared to subjective and normative. How do you approach this in the book? Yeah, uh, very good question. We devoted the whole chapter basically to this question, uh, which is called values. Um, and indeed, we, we take a quite nuanced position on this debate. Uh, often it's sort of presented as a fairly simplistic uh, dichotomy between either you say it's a sci is science, completely objective, or you say it's all politics. Uh, and it's just your opinion. Um, we don't agree with either of the two. Uh, we think indeed that economics should be striving towards objective knowledge uh, and trying to really sort of get to know how the world works. Um, but often uh, values do play a role. So whether it's in sort of the goals, the things that we study, so even the choice of a topic is already a choice of what you find relevant. What is worth knowing? What is worth studying? That's not an objective thing, that's a normative decision. I find it, for example, the decision to f focus on the labor market or focus on climate change, that is often influenced also by these sort of more political and social uh, debates. So there it comes in, but also then in which, which things then you don't focus on, which method do you use? Do you, for example, interview people? Who do you give a voice? Who do you put in, in your statistics? And all these sort of more technical choices, they are not just scientific or objective, uh, but a lot of times values are inevitably part of this process. Um, so it doesn't mean it's all politics and, and, and we sort of just get away with all these concerns about being as, as objective as possible, that's still important. Um, but we should recognize and just be honest that also these other values and these decisions are part of the process. So be explicit about it. Uh, and that counts for research, but also for education. So students need to learn to see them uh, and to identify them and be able to talk about them. Um, so again, coming back to sort of what do professional economists do? 
they often are advising other people to make decisions. When you advise someone, you need to also help them understand sort of what is the moral dilemma here. You can do this. What are the sort of the good and the best aspects of this? That is very much also a normative question, being able to see if you care about efficiency, these are the cons and these are the pros. But if you care, for example, about ecological sustainability or you care about equity, you might draw the attention to different kind of dilemmas and issues. Uh, so we really think that that should be part of the process to teach economists to really bring them out, explain them, uh, and, and really talk about them. So we don't say it is all about politics and we should just forget about being a science. We should strive for it, but we should also exp sort of be explicit about the normative aspects, being able to talk about them and include that in the program. Yeah, maybe one addition to that, so sort of as a, as a practical example or a concrete example. So there's this, this broadly shared, almost unspoken notion that economic growth is a good thing uh, and, and we should strive for economic growth because it's good. And then why exactly it's good? I mean, there are very diverse reasons for wanting economic growth. So one is to say that there are many people who don't have you know, the basic necessities of life. So we need to grow this system that supplies basic necessities of life, the economy, so that there will be more to share. That's, that's, that's a very good reason and, and, you know. But another reason for growth might be, you know, we want, let's say, the Dutch or the European economy to grow uh, because we want to remain a powerful player in uh, the geopolitical system so that, and this again, might be for, for, you know, heartwarming reasons so that we can spread human rights around the world and it can also be for less heartwarming reasons. But these things should be made explicit because if you want economic growth that will make uh, or keep the Netherlands or the EU as, as a powerful player, that might be very different economic growth from what you'd want if you want the basic necessities of life for uh, everyone out there. And then, of course, you know, there's the obvious, uh, fortunately more and more obvious problems with wanting economic growth and, and especially with wanting it indiscriminately, which is the ecological side of the coin. And we just think you should bring these debates into the classroom and at least get students to, to think, even if it's at the basic level of, of listing the different value-laden aspects that are entangled with a question like, do we want economic growth, and if so, what kind? Just to make it a bit more concrete. Cool. I think we are uh, going to the last question. Okay. Uh, but I think this is a good one to end on. Um, what are some tips for people who would uh, also like to attribute uh, to rethinking economics education? Okay. Yeah, that depends who you are. Um, I'm, I'm glad somebody asked this question and people upvoted it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really different for, for, for different people. So let's start with people who, who, if you would not consider yourself an economist or an economic student, you say, you know, of course I live in the economy and, and it matters to my life and to those who I care about, so I want to understand the system, but I am not and will never be an economist. Then I think the first thing to do is maybe to, yeah, learn a bit more, but don't, don't start with a textbook. You, one, one nice book I can recommend, you can read this, but I would, I would rather read something from uh, Hajun Chang, uh, like Economy, the User's Guide. He basically said, well, we all live in an economy, we need a user's guide. Very practical point, from a practical man, I'd say. And, and I think he's really good at explaining one quote from him is, 95% of economics is common sense made complicated. And I would agree with this. There's so many core insights that, that you can actually get without, uh, without becoming very technical or without a, a year-long study. So that's a nice start. And then maybe uh, whenever you're at a, at a birthday party or at a social occasion, don't start your sentences with, I'm not an economist, but, but just say, because you are part of the economy, so, you know. Um, and if you are a student, 
yeah, I think start with start with the tools section of our book. So that's the third part. Um, if you are in a course right now, one one of the standard courses that that Sam showed, like micro, macro, labor, money, and so on. Adapting existing courses is a good starting point for just some material which is pretty much ready to go into one or more lectures which could sort of enrich the course and the same, the exact same advice is for people who teach a course. Um, if you are at a more meta level like maybe program coordinator or dean, um, you could go to the chapter uh, example curricula where, where we sort of try to show how a program might look in the way we try to put together in this book with using these building blocks uh, or maybe the curriculum review tool where you can use the, the different building blocks, the different areas of skills and knowledge to see where there might be big gaps in a program and where, where the biggest potential for uh, expansion is. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Keep thinking for yourself and, uh, and speak <laughs> up about it. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. And maybe, maybe I would add uh, think for yourself but also become part uh, of a larger movement, talk with friends and colleagues. Yeah. Uh, I think also that's like a large story of this book. We didn't do it alone. We did it as being part of this movement. Uh, so, so that's my advice for anyone being motivated to, for this. Try to find people around you, maybe at your university or your country at least, so that you can really work together with them. Or in COVID times, just meet online, of course. Uh, so I would say go to the Rethink Economics website or go to our website. Uh, there are many others which sort of help you uh, guide through this global movement uh, because really it happens everywhere. So, so get connected and then it's way more fun to do. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't have read, written, uh, written this book uh, on my own. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks for all the Thank questions. You. Yeah. <laughs>Yeah, without a microphone, shall I give mine? I think we need to share microphones, uh, like we need to share uh, many, many other things. Um, um, we come to the, the closing of this uh, program, and um, yeah, maybe w one of the questions is, uh, I, I don't think you, uh, you, you picked it up, what are you going to do next? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Yours okay. will yeah. explain. Instead uh, of the microphone. Yeah. yeah um, a, a big part of what we want to do is to, to, to put this into action. So uh, as, as we were surprised when the curriculum reviews came out that so many people do want to change the program uh, and, and are really up for this, we're putting together workshops. So for, for both student groups and also for uh, professors, program managers, deans, um, so, yeah, get in touch. And people yeah. can go to the website and they can contact you and... Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, this, this, I think this is the main next step. We have some other right. wild plans, but that'll come later. Yeah, but that's for... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think uh, then it's uh, time to, uh, to close the live stream. Um, but not before I will uh, thank all the audience uh, uh, here, but uh, at home as well, because we close the live stream first and then we go uh, on with, uh, with a small party here, uh, some drinks uh, we have uh, further. Um, for the people in the live stream, uh, of course, you can go to the website and uh, you can order the book mm -hmm. and read the website and maybe download something from the website. Um, I thank you very much for staying here with us. Uh, I hope to see you again uh, somewhere in the near future, live or again online, uh, because we're from all parts of the world. Um, and I'd like to thank Sam and Joris for the brilliant Q&A. And maybe, um, Julika, you can come on stage because I've... <laughs> oh dear. Uh, we didn't practice this, of course. Uh, you cannot practice such a thing. We have some flowers because it is a book launch so <laughs> thank you thank you very much <laughs> Joris thank you very much and um, well so good